this gentleman is a very fine gentleman who has some things to say to us. Are you ready, <laughs> Greg? We, we have about 30 minutes uh, for this, and then we'll take 15 after that to um, discuss the implications. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Greg. Okay, cool. Thank you, Chris. Let's see. Can everyone hear me and see the slides? Sweet. Okay. All right. So the uh, the intent of this presentation and the reason we're kind of well, not the sole reason why why we're here today, is to go into this uh, long, lengthy report that was released sort of back in the end of December by Dave Humbert, who is a chemical engineer um, consultant, and he was contracted by a group called Open Philanthropy to do this real detailed analysis of the cultivated meat field. So for a bit of um, background information, Open Philanthropy is an organization that you know, um, provides funds and um, giving opportunities to a host of different sort of good causes. And I think that um, the, some of the, the organizers there, the funders were a bit skeptical as to whether cultivated meat was gonna be a worthwhile investment for the, for the resources. So they essentially uh, commissioned Dave Humbert um, to conduct this report to help sort of create an informa information repository out there by a, from a sort of independent third party, but also to kind of guide um, their funding in the future. And so uh, straight from the horse's mouth, when Dave Humbert finished this report, he uh, tweeted it um, and he described it as a study on the economics of scaling animal cell culture in a fermentation-like process. And for anyone who has been uh, asleep or living under a rock for the past little while, um, the CMMC back in August um, released this proof of concept model, which was a, a demonstration that we could unite um, two disparate modeling platforms, both computational fluid dynamics and an agent-based modeling into this novel um, computer modeling framework. And so this model um, focused on a very simple um, configuration for a stirred tank bioreactor, which was actually just a spinner flask system. And it um, used data from an older uh, paper from the 1980s, which um, had grown this, these FS4 cells on microcarriers within a spinner flask. And so the um, computational fluid dynamics portion of the model tracks stir speed and the uh, fluid flow velocities and forces arising from that stirring. And then the agent-based modeling portion of the, the novel framework sort of track the, the cell experience and then cell growth and then forces that were being imparted on the cells from fluid flow um, and, and other dynamics um, of, the, of the stirring in, in the small vessel. And so this again is just further detail about how the model was all put together and I'm just recycling this from a previous presentation. So um, it, I just, just sort of recaps what, what I had said previously, but there's also this one other detail where there was a visualization part of the whole process done in this program called Unity 3D. And I am not the computational mastermind behind all these things. So if you have questions about that, you better uh, defer those to somebody else. But the objectives for today's presentation are sort of fivefold. We're gonna, I wanna try and highlight key aspects of the Dave Humber report place some of these details within the current POC modeling framework for a simple stirred tank bioreactor, uh, detail further information and expertise that's needed to refine the stirred tank model, highlight challenge areas where further research is needed, and then identify current scaling challenges um, for cultivated, cultivated meat broadly that the model could hopefully tackle in the future. And so I'm just gonna go through um, different aspects of the model that are relevant to the agent-based um, portion of it, um, information that's relevant to the computational fluid dynamics portion of the model, um, then sort of have a high level overview of features that we need to incorporate into the current stir tank model in the near um, and, and in the short and sort of longer term. Talk about some of the scaling up challenges that Dave, David Humper uh, mentions, and then um, conclude with some optimization targets um, that are sort of necessary to help really bring cultivated meat into fruition. So firstly, on the agent-based modeling side. So again, this is kind of like a, a high-level overview of the particular content, and then I'll conclude with some more sort of quantitative information that'll hopefully be able to inform the current version of uh, 
the ABM model. So, of course, um, he, um, David Humber goes into a lot of detail around cell composition and cell size, and he has a sort of um, stoichiometric breakdown of the average composition of a, of a typical animal cell that he uses in his modeling efforts. And I'm not going to provide all that information here other than to say that it is, for example, about 70% 70, 70 protein, which is relevant to modeling efforts, particularly considering that we are trying to create a, a food product at the end of the day. One of the major um, food functions of meat is a provision of protein. And I think that that's kind of some, something that we often um, neglect to consider when we're performing some of these, developing some of these computational models. Um, he then talks about cell size um, quite a bit, and there are, of course, different cell sizes so there because there's different cell types that are under consideration for cultivated meat production. Um, but for his modeling purposes, he's come up with an average cell size of about 18 microns in diameter, which he found to be middle of the road for mammalian cells generally. And so um, Elliot's commentary here was to note that adipocytes, which are fat cells, tend to be significantly larger. And then uh, he, he does a really detailed analysis of both cell performance and metabolism. Um, and some of the sort of heading, the, so the key focus areas within this, this broader topic are, he mentions um, details around intracellular chemical reactions, um, possible, number, possible number of generations, both nutrient consumption and catabolite secretion, uh, oxygen utilization as the oxygen uptake rate, and then um, details around heat generation um, as well. And so there, he, there's a whole bunch of information within the report about um, cell performance and, and metabolism. And of course, um, there are many subject matter experts here who could, who could talk about that um, very intelligibly. But I'm just, again, going to try and focus on some of the, the key takeaway messages. So one thing that he talks about um, in his study is he invokes these details from a, a previous um, report on some of the um, animal cell culture um, stoichiometric modeling efforts. And he talks about this idealized growth stoichiometry. And in this, um, glucose is only used for energy production and then the synthesis of lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleotides. Uh, glucose catabolism is completely oxidative with no lactate production. Glutamine is used for protein and nucleotide synthesis. And then other amino acids are used for protein synthesis only. And finally, none of the amino acids are catabolized. So this is, again, an idealized growth stoichiometry for animal cells that he has sort of come up with or, or called upon from, from previous work in the literature. But the issue with this, of course, is that um, an idealized sort of metabolic process is less likely in reality. And so um, we're, you know, in reality, the models will have to um, encapsulate and deal with uh, anomalous things like the Warburg effect, which is something where glucose is fermented to lactose using glycolysis, even in the presence of adequate oxygen, and where amino acids are metabolized for energy, even when ample glucose is provided. And so it's sort of a, it's not totally known why cells, for example, undergo the Warburg effect, but it's, it's speculated that um, intermediates from both glucose and, and glutamine um, metabolism can be used for anabolic reactions actions for the rapid accumulation of biomass. So again, it's the stoich stoichiometry of cell growth is not always going to um, occur under idealized circumstances. So we have to account for other phenomena like the Warburg effect. Uh, but nevertheless, one thing that he mentions in his report is that it, it might be possible to um, realize some of these um, idealized growth stoichiometries if um, different aspects of, of the system components along with oxygen, CO2, pH, and temperature can be controlled dynamically or independently. And so for modeling purposes and, and bioreactor design purposes, this is something that may, we might want to keep in our back pocket. If there's a way to sort of um, control each of these components independently, we could get closer and closer to maximal conversion of input material in, into biomass. So that's something that might be a focus of uh, future um, research efforts. And here, Elliot has uh, mentioned that it's going to be important to understand the variance of amino acid utilization among cells and species that are being considered for cultivated meat production. And so just to conclude the ABM relevant information, um, some more quantitative details that could inform the current sort of agent-based modeling. And one thing that um, Dave continually mentions is that intracellular Reactions generally occur at about a 30 to 80% thermodynamic efficiency. 
And of course, um, primary cells are limited in terms of the number of generations they can undergo. Um, he, something that we've encountered in some of the um, CMMC modeling work is this idea that um, cells are sensitive to Kolmogorov eddy lengths that arise from turbulent fluid flow. Um, he also mentions um, some quantitative information around um, cell sensitivity to dissolved carbon dioxide or partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Also, of course, there's ammonia um, sensitivities at around five millimoles per liter, but um, Elliot has speculated that these could be overcome with cell adaptation. And similarly, there's um, inhibitory concentrations of, for lactate that are around 50 millimoles per liter. But here, um, Elliot thinks that recycling mechanisms or recycle, media recycling technologies, such as those being developed by Future Meat, might be able to overcome some of these limitations. And also there's issues around um, sense, cell, sensitivity of cells to osmolality um, gradients. So this is like an, an osmotic pressure gradient and the sort of the range generally for cell culture media is about 260 to 320 uh, milliosmoles per kilogram. And a final detail here, which is not really relevant to a single cell specifically, but more to the collection of the whole cells totally, is that um, Dave Humbert did a little bit of analysis on how many cells can just physically pack into a space. And he believes that there's sort of a limitation here um, in terms of a, the volume fraction of the cells where they can only pack together on a sort of about a 0.25% volume fraction or 25% volume fraction or about 258 grams per liter wet weight. So that might be a sort of physical limitation about uh, in terms of how many cells can pack together before they start to crash into each other, break, and and ultimately um, become damaged. And so a few more um, important threshold um, details here. So there's a maximum oxygen uptake rate, which uh, he speculates is possible from animal cell culture um, in stir tank bioreactors. And he has derived this from a, a yeast fermentation process where he's um, taken the specifications for the yeast fermentation process and kind of constrained it down to what he thinks is reasonable for an, a large scale um, animal cell culture. And there's some details here around the um, specific oxygen uptake rate, for example, for a, for a single cell. Um, he also has mentioned that he doesn't think that heat transfer is going to be an issue um, in low oxygen uptake rate suspension cultures within the bioreactor. And then there's further information here about the enthalpy dissipation for um, a single cell, either a Chinese hamster ovary cell or a mice hybridoma cell that he has um, derived from previous reports in the literature. But two things that are kind of crucial here that we need to focus on in terms of further research is that we need to um, map the oxygen uptake rate of specific cell types and species that are gonna be used in cultivating meat production. And also, um, Elliot believes it's important for us to confirm um, some of these, um, some of Dave Humbert's sort of conjecture around heat transfer. So will this in fact be a reality? Um, or, and what are its implications for the carbon footprint of the overall future clean meat bioprocess. Now for a bit of uh, information that's relevant to the CFD portion of, of the um, current stir tank bioreactor model. And so quickly, we're just gonna um, go over some of the aspects of measurement of, of aeration and stirring, um, that touch on some of the performance metrics for stirring and aeration. Um, contrast a fermentation process versus an animal cell culture, and then mention again some of these threshold conditions that could inform current modeling efforts on the CFD side. So for the measurement of stirring and aeration, so generally um, the stirring or the agitation rate is quantified in, as the power input per unit volume of liquid, and the units for this are watts per cubic meter. And then uh, gas barge rate or, or aeration um, can be sort of measured with two different metrics. Um, and that's either the VVM, which is the standard volumes of sparge gas per volume of liquid per minute, or another term which is often used, which is the superficial velocity, which is the actual volumetric flow rate of gas divided by the bioreactor cross-sectional area. And these two things together are both um, determinants of the uh, oxygen transfer Rate, which is a very important metric, of course, in, in um, studying different bioprocesses. And so the oxygen transfer rate, um, just for a quick background, is the product of a mass transfer coefficient and a concentration driving force. And the concentration driving force is um, the difference between 
the um, saturation oxygen concentration in the media and that particular temperature, and then the actual oxygen oxygen concentration in the media at that particular temperature, which is of course the dissolved oxygen, oxygen concentration. And so here the important takeaway message is that cell density is limited to the point where the culture's oxygen uptake rate based upon its catabolic demand is equal to the bioreactor's oxygen transfer rate. So in effect, um, you can only you know, get as much out of your cells as you know, the, the amount of oxygen that you can, you can force into the bioreactor with both aeration and stirring. And then this is measured by the oxygen transfer rate. So just for a bit of context, you contrast a fermentation process um, versus an animal, a large scale animal cell culture process. So um, in fermentation processes, you can sparge at up to about two VVM um, and you can stir at a rate of about 5,000 watts per cubic meter. And then the upper limits of the oxygen mass transfer coefficient um, are about 800 reciprocal hours. And then you can contrast that to a, an animal cell culture which you can only generally sparge, which are, which are typically sparged um, at a rate of 0.01 VVM and then stirred at a rate of uh, 100 watts per cubic meter. And so with this, you can see, of course, that um, animal cell culture are in the lower uh, mass transfer re regime compared to fermentation. And finally, um, the, the upper limits of the mass transfer coefficient um, for oxygen of an animal cell culture are, are 15 reciprocal hours compared to um, 800 reciprocal hours for fermentation process. So um, there's quite a bit of um, different differences in terms of um, aeration, stirring, and, and what kind of design capabilities that gives you. And now for some more um, specific quantitative information from the sort of from Dave Humbert's analysis that's relevant to the current um, CFD modeling framework. So again, he, he believes that um, the thermodynamic efficiency of process dynamics within the bioreactor is about 30 to 80%. Um, he has suggested that we limit the impeller rotation um, to a tip speed of about two meters per second. He thinks that um, animal cells can generally be sparged at a rate of um, 0.01 VVM at a maximum, although 0.0 VVM is more common. Uh, he's also says that um, the Kolmogorov eddy length should, if it, becomes less than about 20, less than or equal to about 20 microns, this of course will start to damage the cells. And that the mixing time should be um, less than one over uh, KLA. And the issue here is that when the mixing time is greater than that, um, it's not quickly transporting oxygen away from the bubble into the cell culture medium. And this reduces the effective driving force, which is part of the overall oxygen transfer um, equation. So a bit of a, quickly a bit of further information. Um, he has said that the, um, you know, based upon his um, constraints of a, a yeast bioprocess, that for an animal cell bioprocess, bio that the oxygen tr transfer rate should, should generally, is generally gonna have to be less than 25 moles of oxygen per cubic meter per hour, based upon those um, stirring and aeration limitations I, I mentioned previously. And, uh, the accumulation of CO2 in the media is another, um, you know, potential um, inhibitory force on the growth of the cells, and that the CO2 transfer rate is approximately proportional to the oxygen transfer rate as well. And so, with all these things being said, um, Elliot's sort of commentary here was that we need to explore impeller configurations that are going to boost the oxygen transfer rate, um, or explore the use of oxygen carriers in order to um, tackle some of the challenges or scaling up cultivated meat. And then lastly, um, just to finish off the CFD section, section so up both each of oxygen transfer, mixing efficiency, and the rate of inhibitor accumulation are all important process dynamics that can be tracked or supported by a CFD. And so now, um, you know, we, we, I kind of gave you a, a baseline overview of what the first um, version of the proof of concept model was able to encapsulate in terms of uh, knowledge of both the cells and the bioprocess, but we're going to need to incorporate more information in the future if we want to accurately um, convey all the details of um, the physical environment and then the biological um, phenomena that, that responds to that. And so on the, on the ABM side, there's 
going to be a need to incorporate um, both catabolic and anabolic metabolism um, into the current uh, modeling framework. And of course, this includes um, the carbon source and nitrogen source and other media constituents. We need to um, come up with a, a modeling framework to handle both um, oxygen utilization and CO2 production. Uh, I'm not totally sure if, if biocellian is able to do this, but um, it might also become important to develop stoichiometric relationships that um, relate to the creation of biomass and then the provision of um, nutrients, because we're ultimately trying to create a food product. Um, and the, to the best of my knowledge right now, the, the, the cells that are in the current model are just a, a sort of a rigid sphere, but um, it might be important to um, toggle that in the future to be more representative of, uh, of, of the different cell types, as well as to incorporate information around osmolality sensitivities. And then gene regulatory networks could become an important function to incorporate in the future as well. And then on CFD and the bioreactor environment simulation side, we need to incorporate bioreactor aeration, heat and mass transfer, and then separations, and then downstream processing, as well as links to costing metrics. Two. And so uh, Dave Humber talks about a lot of things in his report, um, and he, you know, in terms of issues around um, scaling up and, and challenges around that. And so now I just want to quickly go over some of his uh, commercial scale estimates, current constraints to um, achieving scale up, and then also some process limitations as well. So one thing uh, he mentions in his report is that he comes up with this figure of 100 kilotons per annum um, as being an amount of uh, biomass that we could produce that would bring cultivated meat as a technology beyond the valley of death, which is associated with new bioproduct development. So that that could become an important figure in, in sort of current modeling efforts and then current scale-up predictions. Um, he also details the amount of glucose that's produced in the U.S. at wet corn mills per annum, and um, there's about, about 4,000 kilotons that, that is produced per year. And so based upon his stoichiometric relation, um, relationships and equations that he's, he's come up with, he, uh, he has determined that that total amount of glucose that's produced each year could make um, well in excess of the amount of animal cell biomass that's needed to overcome the value of death um, in the future. So there, there's enough raw material out there. We just need to develop the, the infrastructure to handle and, and process it. But what are some of the constraints today to um, scaling up this, uh, to meet some of these uh, you know, like the, this valley of death threshold amount. So right now, animal cell culture is not practiced in bioreactors that are larger than 25 cubic meters. And then there's um, the maximal achievable cell density in smaller and larger reactors, uh, for example, is, is um, means that there's a huge amount of, of bioreactor infrastructure required to, to produce um, consumable amounts of food. So we need to be able to address some of these um, issues and, and some of the, the numbers are given here. Also, the amino acids, which are an important part of um, cell culture, are not produced at the volumes that were needed um, in scale up. And an alternative here, which is well recognized in cultivated meat production, is the potential use of plant protein hydrolase, which may be more sustainable and cost effective. However, here, um, an important area of future study is to map the hydrolysate compositions to the metabolic requirements of cells. And so again, further limitations are um, the, uh, this issue around um, 30 to 80% thermodynamic efficiency of the processing equipment, so it's not 100% efficient, um, that you can only, the reactors can only become so large um, before the cell um, function starts to break down in response to heterogeneities within the growth environment. Um, he's also noted that in smaller reactor volumes, um, oxygen limitation and accumulation of ammonia are um, more limiting factors, whereas at larger reactor volumes, it's mixing time, which becomes more of an issue. And then in tall vessels, of course, you can get um, localized pressure gradients, um, which is another significant challenge to address in, in scaling up um, modeling efforts. Uh, a few couple other things to quickly mention is the fact that um, the pr uh, partial pressure of CO2 limitations um, on cell density in large reactors often outweighs the cost benefits of, um, of very large uh, reactors. And that uh, there's some of the tangential flow filtration units that are out there in existence today um, 
are capped in terms of how productive they can be. This might be a little bit more relevant to a perfusion bioreactor setup, for example, but it nonetheless could also be useful for a stirred, useful information for a stirred tank system if you're trying to pull material out of those reactors continually, for example. And then uh, he, Dave Humbert also goes into this long detailed description about some of the many challenges associated with maintaining sterility um, within a, a conceptual animal cell culture bioreactor and all the costs associated with that. So the takeaway from all this is that we still have lots and lots of work to do and um, computational modeling in conjunction with um, physical lab experiments um, uh, can you know, address some of these many issues. So a couple more things quickly you over. These are some optimization targets that um, he has mentioned to, that he believes should help um, overcome some of the, the bottlenecks in, in bringing this technology into fruition. So here again are um, increasing the toleration of plant protein hydrolysates and as, as an amino acid source, um, figuring out ways to lower the um, susceptibility of cells to bubble damage, um, figuring out again about ways to achieve higher attainable growth rates and cell densities. And then he has also mentioned um, optimizing growth stoichiometry through cell line characterization and engineering approaches. And here again is um, reducing the um, inhibitory effects of CO2 and metabolite sort of inhibition generally. And then specifically looking for phenotypes that can um, uptake lactate as well as potentially inducing genetic modifications that could handle uh, the accumulation of ammonia intracellularly. So with a, with a glutamine synthetase enzyme. And then finally, um, both feedback control of glucose and, and then pH could also be um, further targets to optimizing in the bioprocess. And lastly, I just want to um, drive home some of the, the very helpful points that Elliot made, um, as he's a bit of a, you know, he's a bit of a mensch in the field of cultivated meat. So some of the details that he suggested that we focus on again are confirming that heat transfer is not an issue for animal cell culture. Understanding the variance of amino acid utilization among cells and species used for production, mapping the hydrolysate compositions to the metabolic requirements of cells, and then we again need to understand the um, oxygen uptake rate of the many different cell types that are going to be used in cultivated meat. And then lastly, we can explore other configurations that could boost the oxygen transfer rate um, or oxygen carriers within a bioreactor. With that, I am done. And I just wanted to say thank you for sitting through my presentation. Um, and full disclosure, I am neither purely um, you know, a chemical engineer or a computational modeling specialist. So if I talked in generalities, um, it was for a good reason. But I, I can do my best to answer any questions you may have. And besides any general questions that you have, um, this meeting is scheduled to go for another 16 minutes. And um, so hopefully you can stick around. I know it's the top of the hour. Sometimes people have to go at that point, but hopefully you can stick around because I'd like to open up the floor to just have a general discussion of the report, as well as any questions you might have about what Greg has presented and um, talk about the implications. Uh, and for us to, to strategize together about how our modeling efforts can uh, support, like Greg said, the tremendous amount of work to be done. So I'll just open the floor to anybody for that. Hey, Greg, this is Sumitra uh, from New Age Meets. Uh, thank you for that summary. That was really efficient. Um, I perhaps have a general topic of discussion. Um, in the sense, some of these um, engineering constraints in scale up going into hundreds of thousands of liters is um, not a novel problem. The good old antibody production units have basically overcome this. Um, so I guess my thought around that is um, while our current uh, industry is is gathering speed is are these scale up uh, bottlenecks uh, and the solutions we can bring about it is the constraint more um, because of the cost uh, because obviously if you're on a 
antibody production platform, which looks at an industry where cost is not a barrier because of the end product. Versus if we apply those sort of relative solutions and the economic balance, it's fairly costly. Um, so I guess summarizing my question would be, is it the novelty in engineering that we are trying to introduce to sort of aspects that have already been answered because we're trying to limit the cost uh, or the cost of, you know, getting a, a, a production platform? Or is it uh, a sense of novelty that we are trying to bring to this industry? Um, I, one thing that struck me in the report that might be relevant to your uh, question was that he mentioned, for example, that for Chinese hamster ovary cells, they've been working on refining um, them and making them more, more appropriate for, um, for example, for antibody production and other um, sort of uses for over 60 years, you know, and so they've had a lot of time to, to make them more robust, to better understand um, their metabolism and, and to make them more efficient. But I mean, there's many, many cell types that are um, being used for, or that are under consideration for cultivated meat that are, are be used, being used for this purpose, um, you know, for the first time and they're not well characterized and there's not a, a real thorough understanding of how to, um, you know, grow them and handle them in a, in a way that won't, won't damage them. And, and, a, and of course, Chinese hamster, uh, O ovary cells are, I think they're probably more robust than, than some of the other um, sort of muscle stem cell types that, that are under consideration for growth. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a different, it's a different sort of um, kettle of fish that you're dealing with. And I think that ultimately will require um, more basic research and, and then the development of um, these sort of novel bioprocesses for these specific cell types. All right. So, sorry, just to dovetail that. So it feels like the the characteristic bioprocess platforms are set, but there's a, we have to get more traction on understanding the multiple cell cultures that are being used for a novel process. Because again, if you take stem cells and look at it, they are being manipulated and produced for really uh, sensitive therapeutic markets, but we can't apply those same uh, biological principles here because of cost. Um, but we also don't have had as uh, you know, 60 years of experience with the multitude of CHO cells that the other markets have had and no one wants to eat insect and CHO cells. Um, so it's, it just comes back to feeling like, uh, not feeling, essentially assessing that this is, the biologics are the constraints and the lack of uh, having had enough years of experience around the cell characterization and the culture characterization versus uh, the fairly, I think, well characterized scale up variables. Like if cost wasn't a constraint, we have a platform that essentially can produce kilograms per liter if needed of stem cells. Let's just throw it out there. But we have so many unknowns of how these cultures um, can do it efficiently and cost effectively for our market. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of unknowns in terms of you know where the, the best targets are for process intensification. I think you know whether, like you say, um, is it is it on the processing side or is it on you know making certain aspects of it cheaper or handling cells differently? And the whole point is that because there's so much sort of unknown information that developing these these you know computational models to understand the system and then be able to model the different cell types and hopefully tie that all into um, costing costing metrics will will direct um, you know, future you know research and process development towards um, ultimately the best process intensification strategy, right? And so I think that's the point of, of doing all this work. And you know, the, these are all the unknowns. Here's all the information that we have. Here's how we can bring it into a model. And how can we then use the model to um, direct us to the best kind of process intensification strategies on 
So is it on the bioreactor development side? Is it on the novel cell type side? Is it some sort of combination of both? Um, but there really is just a lot of um, information that needs to be done on all ends of the work. I think, you know, just, just to tie those, those points together in the context of the CMMC and, you know, how Chris led off of around like, you know, creating a data repository that, that people use. I mean, it seems like there is a lot of room to source just general basic data. Um, you know, there's several people in the consortium that are interested in, in metabolic modeling and engineering and, and understanding that across the different cell types in, in cultured meat, as, as you mentioned, Sumitra and, and Greg, I mean, there's been so much knowledge built over decades in other cell types and other industries, but here we're you know, starting from scratch in many ways. Um, I just think it's interesting, like I, there's so many implications for just like having a nice understanding of the metabolism of cells and that, you know, just from a supply side of things in terms of the raw materials that you use and that we have to upscale if, if, if cultivated meat works. I mean, it has a dramatic implications as well as from the sustainability side. Um, so, I, I mean, just thinking about starting points on where we can, as a community, source data and begin work. Um, I think that's a, a big area. Yeah, thank you for that. I think it'll also be important to get data for, for different cell types uh, on uh, the gene expression level or proteomic level. Uh, of course, it's interlinked with metabolism, but to really uh, be able to model genetic regulatory networks, or transcriptional regulatory networks. Uh, and uh, ultimately, you know, that it, use them as control mechanisms to for cellular state changes. So it could be, you know, proliferation or differentiation or other state changes. Uh, so I think that's another area where innovation needs to happen as well as data collection, just to add to what Elliot said. I wanted to ask a question concerning the multicellular aspects of this work. Do the cells form any kind of uh, granules during this process? Is there a role of adhesion or multicellular interactions? Uh, I think, well, we were, we were on a call and maybe somebody else else can correct me if I'm wrong, that we've recently talked quite a bit about um, cell aggregation as a, as a phenomenon that needs to be considered and, and then um, encapsulated. But um, to the best of my knowledge, that's not a, a feature of, of the current model, but maybe um, Simon or Boris, if he's here, could, could speak to that a bit more. Um, hello. Uh, I I think we, we are not modeling cell aggregation, meaning that um, we are not focusing on how the cells that are not in the supporting microcarrier are aggregated. But uh, we, are, we also have cell-cell adhesion in the model. It's just that we cannot model the number of microcarriers and the number of cells uh, the number of cells and number of microcarriers are not enough in our models to get this effect of cell aggregation. We, we have limitations in our computational power. So we need to model just a fewer number of microcarriers in the bioreactor. So, so that's, a, that's the state of the model. But we have cell adhesion on it, cell cell adhesion. That's included. I mean, the question is whether aggregation is, is desirable or not. Is it something that you'd want to model for reasons of trying to um, understand it, to encourage it, which is um, some researchers are interest, very interested in that. In fact, having the, the cells differentiate um, within the bioreactor and others. Uh, see that as a bad thing and something that should be avoided um, because um, but because it does tend to cause clumps and necrosis and you know once the clumps get big enough and so on 
So it's really a, a, it's actually something that we do want to model. It's just as Boris said right now, the density in this particular model instance is so low that the opportunity for, for uh, microcarriers to crash into each other is, is too small to actually see it happen. But if they did, if the if microcarriers did come in into contact, they, they would stick together uh, via cell adhesion. It, it is important to consider that the model that Greg went through was not on microcarriers. Those cells were just in, in single cell suspension. And I think that was the assumption. Um, so it's, it's different. Yeah. He does talk a little bit about growing influenza cells on microcarriers. Um, uh, and he alludes to the fact that those bio um, reactors are really small. They're just six cubic meters and then they Sometimes they can't even necessarily sparge them because it'll damage the cells or they can sparge them very lightly, but um, the, the possible densities there were, were quite low and the reactors were small for those microcarrier um, based processes for influenza vaccine production. What I also understood from, uh, from our call um, last week, was that this, these cell aggregates um, mainly happen because of the cell microcarrier adhesion, not because of the cell cell adhesion. Yeah, sorry. So that in a suspended culture, you wouldn't have this much aggregation because it's actually the cells on top of one microcarrier adhering to another, another microcarrier and not to the cells. Yeah, which works better if you're planning to eat the microcarriers um, as yeah. opposed to have to separate them out later. Plastic bowls. Yeah. So I'm, I'm still wondering, you know, with this report, whether it's, it's viewed as something, you know, negative, uh, like where it, it's going to take a tremendous amount of work to get the cost down um, of cultivated meat. Uh, if we follow this this overall approach with bioreactors and, and so on, or, or um, whether it's just saying, well, forget about using conventional bioreactors, we need to do something different. And uh, of course, use media that's a lot coarser than pharmaceutical grade to get the cost down. I mean, what, so, I mean, it, it's, or, or is it just hopeless, I mean, but um, it's always gonna be more expensive than butchering animals. Right, power saw in the background. Um, is, is there any is there any sense of that um, in, in reading it? Well, I think the answer has to be innovation. You just have to think outside the box. And clearly, this simple bioreactor model with cells in suspension is some sort of a well, it's like a straw man almost. And or you have to uh, think uh, in some other way. Uh, and I'm not, I don't know what that way is, but uh, I think that's what it will take. Uh, maybe new designs with, uh, with some kind of, uh, you know, fractal scaffold designs inside the bioreactor where you can get much higher density. So some of those assumptions won't hold in that report, basically. If, and, you know, and so I think that's what it will take. Yeah, so I'm wondering, well, what are the intrinsic, you know, the fundamental limitations? This is the best you could possibly do versus, well, you know, given these constraints of, of growing in a, in a stirred tank bioreactor um, and so on, these are assumptions that we've made. Uh, those are the limiting factors and that's what you need to innovate around, you know, specifically. Yeah, I, so I was surprised by the oxy, oxygen uptake rate uh, because I think we, uh, until now we had sort of assumed that oxygen wouldn't be a problem because it was okay mixing and not enough cells to actually take all the ox oxygen. Um, so then maybe if you need to stir harder in a stir tank bioreactor, this is not the right system to uh, to go with. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think Greg's like, you know, the presentation I and mean, what you take from these is not you know the the truth but you use it as a sort of informing the the bottlenecks that exist and that you focus on and i think greg greg laid those out pretty 
pretty nicely. I think, you know, from my perspective in, in this, the context of this group, I mean, it, um, there's like, there's bioprocess and bi bioreactor design considerations and things that you can do around that and knobs that you can turn. And then there's like the cell biology and the basic biology uh, data that is more on the, the ABM side of things. And it, it, it just would be useful to know, do you work on those in parallel? Is it more important to, to figure out the ABM parameters first and then that informs the rest? Or, you know, from a consortium standpoint, where do you, where do you go? Um, as a most prioritized and urgent uh, things to address. No people are going to be jumping off the call now, which is fine. Um, but I, uh, my company is kind of in the nutrient business, so this statement carries a lot of weight. But if I was going to now, after, and also I've only been in cultured meat now for seven weeks. Um, but if I was going to create my own cultured meat company, I now think that the biggest problem to solve is the oxygen problem. And here's why. Um, oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor. So it doesn't really matter what nutrients you have in, in your tank. If you don't have enough oxygen there, nothing's going to happen. So what I would, the first problem that I would solve is the oxygen problem and then solve all the subsequent problems that come after that from having oxygen in abundance. So, you know, increase lactate buildup if that happens, increase, you know, uh, reactive oxygen species, you're going to have to offset those. Um, and that's, that's the place where I would start. And then I would choose my cell type based on which one is going to respond um, the best to those oxygen settings and kind of work down like that. But that's just my opinion. Um, that did want to want to chime in. Thanks, Rebecca. I like that. Um, but the oxygen consumption uptake or the, con the oxygen supply, I think, is a fairly um, easy to solve with striated oxygen supply. I mean, I say easy with a caveat. I mean, if you just take a look at a twenty thousand liter vertical system, sort of tiered supply is. Um, not easy in the in the direct meaning of the word, but overall supply to the volume could could be engineered in relatively easy on an existing platform. But to dovetail to Elliot's, I think it's at least my perspective perspective, and I would push my teams on this would be, working essentially in parallel with how the culture performs in some sort of a scalable vessel volume. Um, because how the cultures perform uh, by themselves individually at anything smaller than what we would want to be a scalable platform is, is sort of isolated incidents. We're giving them the best case scenarios, but once we start putting them into environments where we're essentially self-selecting cells on how they respond, um, essentially pushes them towards metabolic pathways that you might not see otherwise when they're in sort of a gentler environment. And getting that dynamic info as we push from expansion to other pathways also naturally shifts those cultures into metabolic streams that we might not get um, if we just study them as a culture by themselves. So I think a lot of parallel studies and sort of one of my colleagues always says, you know, we fly the plane while we build it kind of thing. Um, <laughs> and again, this is, this is um, essentially how a lot of big antibody productions based, whether it's on perfusion or express proteins based on fed batch cultures with continuous processing kind of had to decouple what went on with multiple uh, CHO strains and now insect strains. So I think, um, the decoupling has to happen while we are like producing kind of at a reasonable uh, equivalent scale down. I'm not gonna call it a qualified scale down, Molly, but equivalent scale down 
model just so that we get real time um, indications of how the cultures are going to uh, react when we stress them. Because we are going to push those design limits. Um, okay, I'll say something. Um, relevant, very relevant to that. Uh, what I've sort of observed, I'm very new to all of this, is that we're looking a lot at sort of uh, physical laws and upper bounds of what physics says we should be able to do without having a particularly principled idea of what the cells will do, which is almost certainly vastly less. And that this is going to take essentially a very, very, in, a, a, a model of almost all of the processes at once, integrating all the knowledge we have from all the different areas of expertise that each person has, because of the fact that there's so much interaction between these different areas, the different things that are going on. This is why I am so interested in making a database because I think there's so much that we can say uh, as a result of the experiments that have been done, so much that we can generalize from them. But without doing this, uh, problems like the Warburg effect, name any of them, just to, uh, unpredictable changes in metabolism, um, stem cells losing any of their potency, any of their proliferative properties that we would like, uh, can and will happen in ways that we can't foresee unless we essentially have a, not complete, but at least if course, um, comprehensive model of what's happening. If anyone wants to react to that, I'd be very grateful because this is essentially where I'm at with respect to thinking about this database. This, this is essentially what I want to see happen. Um, currently, there doesn't seem to be a database because there doesn't seem to be much of a demand for, or at least much work producing very cross-cutting models. So it's comparatively easy for people to just take bits of data from different places and use them for what they need. Whereas the real advantage from having an integrated repository, a powerful API, whatever else, would be that you could essentially take all of the different experimental data that's been extracted a hundred different ways and produced a model which can be validated against essentially all of that depending on how sophisticated the te techniques you use are. Well, I'll react to that. Uh, Anton, that's music uh, to my ears. I think I, I totally uh, buy into that vision. I think we have to think very integratively. Uh, I am uh, at the Institute for Systems Biology. That's sort of our mantra. Uh, we really integrate uh, knowledge at all levels, right? So you, all the omic levels, if you want to think in terms of data. And in order to do that, you do have to have these central repositories. I work in the field of cancer research at, at the and and I'm I'm involved in this kinds in these kinds of uh, repositories and cloud-based uh, uh, platforms. Uh, with the National Cancer Institute. And this would be the same kind of thing, but for a different domain. So yes, two thumbs up. Thank you. Oh, I was nervous. My voice was breaking. So thank you for that. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> yeah, just amazing that you want to pick this up, Eitan. So. Yeah, because I mean, to bring back maybe what Alex was saying right at the start, I was thinking when he said it, I really wasn't sure, but we have no idea essentially how the cells would react to the way that we could expect computational fluid dynamics to break down at this scale. I'm not sure whether it would actually need another order of magnitude or two, but to the extent that it would, I don't think any department in the world really has the understanding of cell mechanics and how it reacts to the fluids around it to model the effect on the cell of anything more than the kinds of fairly coarse of fluidic mechanisms that Navier Stokes would give us at this scale. I don't know if Alex is still around, I'd be interested to talk about this. I'm still here. Uh, you'll have to repeat uh, the last bit. So it, it might well be true that we could expect Navier states to break down at roughly this scale, or at least begin to. 
but our understanding as far as I can tell, and I've, I've had a little look at issues like this of how we could expect the cells to react to molecular level phenomena is so weak that essentially the kind of signal we could get to Navier Stokes is essentially the uh, as much as we could use anyway. Um, I mean, if I'm understanding what you're saying, um, are you basically trying to make the point that, well, I'll, I'll just say this. It's it's not so much that so so it's not going to be a complete breakdown of Navier Stokes. It's a no, transition. So as your length scales decrease, um, different things start happening, right? So um, so your slip length increases gradually. I mean, I'm sure. I'm, I assume in your CFD at the moment you're making the assumption that there is no slip. Sorry, that there is. Uh, well, actually, I suppose if the person here who's doing the work can speak up. You're probably making the assumption that uh, uh, there is no slip in this in this uh, configuration that you showed at the beginning. If the person's still here, no, fine. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. So, so, so your boundary conditions at your walls is it a no-slip boundary condition? Yeah, it's a non-slip boundary condition. Yeah. Right. So we're not. So it's not clear um, whether at these scales that's a valid boundary condition. For example. If you're going to get, if you get, if you get, um, I don't know, cell adhesion at the walls, for example, right, wherever wherever they exist, um, is it is it a fair assumption to say that you have no slip at the walls? It might be that your slip length is non-zero, which means that you have a velocity at the walls, which affects your cell behavior. Do you see what I'm saying? So currently, in our safety modeling, like we even didn't consider any cells at all. So we just assume the, the fluid uh, properties is just the pure water uh, properties in our current models. And in terms of like the coupling from the CFD and the ABM coupling, so how we are going to address that, uh, we are still need to like uh, develop some strategies to work on that. Yeah. So my, my, my point was just that I don't know the details about how we can expect these conditions to break down, but labs all over the world seem to just sort of assume that the most we can really say about the effects on the fluid, of the fluid on the cells is something like macroscale shear stress, which we are going to capture and which will be there regardless of whether it is the most accurate way of Constraint at level. But, but you see, that, that's, that, that's dangerous, though, because, I mean, you're making assumptions um, about your shear stress. Well, you're, you're deriving a shear stress based on incorrect assumptions, potentially, right? You're deriving, you're deriving a value. You'll always pull out a, a shear stress, yes, fair enough. But, you know, the, the assumptions that, that, that led to that, one. yeah. We will pull one out, but will it be radically different? Because you're talking about microscale breakdown, I wouldn't, I couldn't, I wouldn't expect that to produce a big macroscale difference. Well, we, we, it has to be, it has to be tested. Basically, we're making your. I mean, you wouldn't expect it to, but does it or doesn't it? <laughs> you see? Oh, uh, okay, yeah. So oh. my point would just be that, given how little we know about cells react to physical signals crossing their membrane, we're a long way from being able to begin to deal with microscale effects, which was why I brought this up to begin with, um, following from the points I made before. So I think actually there are two questions here needs to be answered. One is like, if only talk about the CFD alone, for some kind of scales of these uh, bioreactors or the EBD system, whether the Navier stoke equation is still valid or not, so that one should be easy to think about. We just need to check like what's the criteria for the never stock equations to use that equation to solve the CFD models. So the second question, which is more complicated, which is how we can do the coupling things with the CFD, which is in a large scale. And for the ABM model for the cell behavior, which is a micro scale behavior. 
So for that second problem, how we couple that? So we are, we are still working on developing these kind of strategies. We are still not uh, kind of uh, have a good idea on that yet. And uh, yeah, but that is really a good point. And I think that uh, needs a lot of work uh, to be think about for the future steps. One comment I have on these models is all our models are approximations and uh, we're not sure of their fidelity. Um, but one thing I'm really interested in is, is which bits of the model need to have a high fidelity and which parts we can get away with some roughed out components. And that's always the hard part because we may put a lot of energy into components of the model uh, and in, in enhancing those models while um, we're, it's sort of good enough for what we have now. So which bits, where should we focus the work on model improvement? It seems to me like this is exactly what we need a whole cell model for, because if we can't see which signals crossing the membrane of the cell are affecting the sort of food relevant or volume relevant qualities we need, we can't even begin to think about this, which is, I guess, what I was saying. There were certain limitations that uh, it was mentioned that they could be overcome, you know, easily by a cell adaptation or novel processing strategy. So if, if you could systemize all the sort of impediments to example for cell growth and the ones that are easily solvable, um, you know, with current technology versus the ones that require novel technology, then that might be a way to streamline those efforts and focus your energy on the things that are um, you know, most important to, to develop with modeling in terms, you know, versus things that could be you know, currently solved with um, technology that's, that's readily available right now. Well, looks like we may have come to a natural stopping place. Um, thank you, everybody, for showing up and contributing. Um, I think the big question for me moving forward is, is there a way that we could have more of these discussions happen uh, in real time? I don't know. But I'm, I'm just realizing that there's so much we could talk about, so much we could unpack. I'm curious if folks uh, would have any topics for conversation they might want to throw in the slack and say hey i want to chat about x y or z um to see if if uh, people can 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 gel around that i don't know um just a, a question i'm leaving with so yeah thanks everybody thank you again greg i was amazed at the thoroughness of the report it was it was a beautiful thing um obviously generated a lot of discussion and it's really helpful uh next month uh, we don't have a clear idea yet who will be presenting. So if you have um, some ideas uh, or you yourself want to uh, present something, let us know. We can see how that fits. And uh, with that, I think we'll, we'll leave it off. So we'll see you next month. Thanks, everybody.